The Magar. The Magar Bas Mordecai. So, Brown was born in the 54, Blue Rocks in 57. Now let's talk about Magar Bas Mordecai. Now, I'm a really, really good artist, better than all of you guys put together. I'm going to draw you a bus. All right? From the top. If you're looking down into the bus, it looks like this. Okay? Looks like the bus was a yesterday. He had the top hat on. The bus driver had the top hat. I like the wheel a different color. So you guys will know it's a wheel, not just like, you know, a weird part of his body. Okay. It's a really big wheel. It's a bus. And then here's the door. It swings in. Like that. All right. And there are three sections of these buses, right? You have the white section. You have the black section. And then you actually have sort of a combined section, right? And it's this combined section, it's not just that they were segregated, but it's in this combined section, if a black person sat here and a white person wanted to get the seat, the black person had to give it up. That makes sense? By law. Yeah, absolutely by law. Rosa Parks was actually not the first person that the NAACP was going to have do this. This was not, one of the things that the Civil Rights Movement did really well, it was way smarter than the anti-civil rights movement. All these badang-dang dudes in the South who wanted to stop civil rights, they just weren't as smart. The civil rights dudes were really smart. And they knew that public transportation, African Americans took a lot of public transportation. And it was a giant indignity that they had to sit in the back. This is the next step, right? One more thing they're trying to chip off. And they were going to press it. They were going to challenge it. And they needed a face of someone to do it. Rosa Parks, in the history books, is written as a, a poor old seamstress who was just so tired. That is not really true. D was, did she work as a seamstress? Yeah. You know what her job was before she was a seamstress? Secretary of the NAACP in, J in Mississippi. Of Jackson, Mississippi. Oh. <laughs> yeah. She, and she wasn't even that old. People were like, oh, she was just tired old. She just died not that long ago. She wasn't 90 in 1955. But that's kind of how we remembered it as a nation. That she was, you know, gnarled fingers from her work and working 18 hours a day. The civil rights movement knew they needed somebody who was educated, well-spoken, attractive, and someone that would be um, a sentimental figure. Because one thing that the civil rights did really well is they used television. They knew, especially in the, in the, in the nonviolent civil rights movement, when you have nice, nice looking, educated people over here, whether they were white or black, who were fighting for civil rights, and you had hateful, white, mean people over here screaming and yelling, it's on TV. People who are living in, like, you know, California or Washington or Oregon or Nebraska or Illinois, what are they thinking? Those people are crazy. What the smirk is going on in Alabama, right? Or in Georgia or South Carolina or whatever. It, it is a great juxtaposition. student came and she knocked at my door and I like I opened the door. This is my sec this is my second year teaching, you know, third year teaching. And I was way worse back then. I was I was militant about my classroom back then. And she goes, um can I have and she kind of I was like, no you can't and I just shut the door in her face. <laughs> As it turns out she was on an errand for Mr. Woodyard. Huh. So I got an email, and when you got the email, Mr. Woodyard just said, see me. That was not good. 
Um, when it said, see me now, that's worse. And I got a see me now email. So I went, he was like, see me after school. And I was like, ugh, I didn't want to, I would rather just get all, get that punishment over with, right? I didn't want to think about it all day. So I ran to Mr. Woodyard's office in between periods. And he was like, um, you're never going to shut the door in a student's face again. She was on an errand for me. And I was like, I'm sorry. Um, it ends up with the student. The student ended up being, um, on, I used to coach tennis, and she was my number one tennis player. I ended up being really close to her, but at that point, she entered my class. So I, I kicked the door. <laughs> Very bright. Um, so the first person that the civil rights movement in Montgomery wanted to use was actually a 15 or 16 year old girl and she got pregnant and they didn't want to use her because of the publicity of it, right? So Rosa Parks was arrested for violating the um, Jim Crow laws on the bus and she goes to jail and the reaction was very unique, I shouldn't say very unique, there's no, it means one of a kind, so there's no gradation of what's your unique, unique. Um, they refused to ride the bus right we all know the boycott but why was the boycott different what gave why is this different this form of protest than other forms of protest it's economic it's about power it's about money yeah African Americans now have at least enough economic power to go against and force whites to bend to their will because they have economic power. Not a lot, but enough. And a huge portion of the riders of the Montgomery bus system were African American. Therefore, they had economic clout. And this lasted for, what, almost four, oh, over a year. And a very um, young man was tapped to be the leader of the bus boycott. He was only 26 years old. Martin Luther King was nine years younger than I am now when he started becoming a national civil rights leader. He was assassinated when he was 30. He was only 38 when he was assassinated. He was really young. He would still be around today. He would be in his 80s today. I don't know when he was born. I mean, he was, well, he was 26 and 55, so 55 minus 26 is um, 29, right? So he'd be uh, 83. Do what? 83? Yeah, he'd be two years younger than my grandmother. So. Um, now you're like, well, how big of a deal is this? African Americans, uh, taxi cabs that were ran by black people charged of just a bus fare for taxi rides. People walked everywhere. White women who had African American females as their domestic servants would drive them back and forth oftentimes. Not that white people wanted to condone this, many of them, but all these white women couldn't survive without black women doing all their work. So they would go to their house and pick them up and drive them back. You guys have all seen the help, right? In the South, middle class women, white women, had African Americans in their house doing most of their work. Um, when I was a kid in South Carolina, our babysitter was um, a black woman, and my dad every day got up in the morning, went to her house, because she didn't have a car, picked her up, drove her to our house. She watched my sister. I went home, I went to school, came back, and she watched me. Her name was Mrs. Robinson. After school, he picked her up, took her back home. And she lived in a surrogate town. Her house was on like cinder blocks and stuff. Um, it was like an old, almost like sharecropping house. Um, really stereotypical. One time we had a black snake in our yard. Um, South Carolina has a lot more snakes. And she took my dad's pitching wedge and beat it to death. I remember it like it was yesterday. I came in and I was screaming about a snake in the yard. She just grabbed this thing and just went off on the snake and left it there for all the other snakes to see. And it was it was pretty brutal. Oh, slash awesome. And ironically, my dad's really bad with his pitching wedge. It was the most success that anyone's ever had with a pitching wedge. Um, Martin King's house got bombed. This is how much, it wasn't just the whites didn't like they weren't buying tickets. What was this about? Power. 
It was about blacks thinking that they have power over whites, and that was not good enough. It wasn't about segregation. It was about what segregation meant. Because poor white people, remember we talked about this like in um, pre-Civil War society, right? slaves on the bottom, poor whites above them. Poor white people wanted somebody above them. Segregation was a way of life that was so ingrained that anyone who questioned it was disturbing. And that's why if you're in the South and you question civil rights and you ask for changes, you could be a communist in the 50s. That's what you could be branded as. Finally, the city of Montgomery relented. King was arrested, but finally the Supreme Court actually ruled this was unconstitutional. And King is going to establish, well, not just King, but King and many other civil rights leaders, Christian pastors, are going to establish the Southern, Conference, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. And this is a group of almost entirely pastors, not all, but mostly pastors, who are going to promote nonviolent resistance. Remember, when you think about African American leaders, not so much today, but even in the um, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even the 70s, they are almost all religious figures. African Americans are, as a group, more religious than white people. Actually, there's like an inverse relationship between income amongst a group and um, religious allegiance. Um, the two most religious minority groups in America are African Americans and Hispanic Americans. The two, re the two least religious are white Americans. Who's the least religious? Asian. Asian Americans are the least religious as a minority group, and they actually, as a group, make the most money. That makes sense. Do they really? I don't know. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> in Kentucky, you know, we have all this data about how our minority students are doing. They don't count Asians as minorities in our thing. They used to a couple of years ago. So like when Cindy and Sandy were here, I looked like I was the greatest AP teacher ever because all my minority students were rising. I had three minority students in my AP US class, and they were three of the smartest kids in class. It was Cindy, Sandy, and Todd. Um, and um, you guys know uh, Tatiana Cody? Or Tatiana, um, yeah, Tatiana Cody. I point because that's where she's at. I see she's sat right there. Her hands um, and yeah, I looked like I was the greatest teacher of minority students ever, not that was the truth. Cindy and Sandy, they don't even count. If you're Indian, or Asian, you don't count in the minority um, That's stuff. Really kind of funny. Yeah, which sort of screws Dunbar over because yeah. they can look like they're the greatest teachers of minority students because everyone is, you know, a professor's kid from UK. Wait, no joke. Last, yes, last night. night, four Asian girls on the Dunbar team. Four. All four of them. Like, it was the only, it was only girls and they were all Asian? Yeah, they were only girls and they were all Asian. Asian. Mm -hmm. I also um, play soccer with the Asian Yeah, girls. I mean, well, I, I can tell you that um, my in Indiana, where I went, went to high school, we had a lot of Japanese. My dad worked for a Japanese company. I worked for a Japanese company when I first got out. There are a lot more Japanese families. The, the stereotype about Asian people, though, that's like, every Asian person is smart. It's not a stereotype. Why do why have we seen though Asian and Indian Americans do really really well? Yeah, because, well, one, because culturally, the cultural dynamic of Asian culture is one of following rules, right? And, and to be fair, in a school like this, if you follow the rules and do what you're supposed to, you're, you're probably going to be okay. But a lot of these parents also are pushing because it, stereotypes tend to perpetuate themselves, right? Black people are good at basketball. Well, it's not like people who are black are born being good basketball players, but if you see people who are playing basketball look like you, what are you more likely to do? Like basketball. If you see Asian people who are good at math, even if you're awesome at basketball, what do you tend to do? <laughs> Be good at math. That's why Jeremy Lin's so weird, right? People aren't used to seeing an Asian kid be in the NBA who's not seven foot four, right? Um, but he also holds stereotypes too. What is so typical about Jeremy Lin? He's really smart. He has an economics degree from Harvard. And so he actually is a myth, or a stereotype buster, but also holds the stereotype too. He's also religious. He's also, really religious. He's also very religious. Which yeah. Is so so he's just, he's just right. <laughs> yeah he's all over the place. Yeah, and he actually has a weird, and he has a weird political thing too because his parents are Taiwanese, 
but the, but the mainland China also holds him as one of their own. And he won't come out for two reasons. He won't come out and say, I am just Taiwanese. One, because he sees himself as Chinese, not just from Taiwan, because you know, his, his actual heritage is from China. But also, if he comes out and says, I'm just from Taiwan, he's going to make a trillion less dollars because everyone in China will stop buying his crap. When he goes over to China and makes appearances and stuff, he makes tons of money. How many people in China run around with a Jeremy Lin jersey on? Yeah, a lot. It is the most popular jersey probably in the world after LeBron James, maybe even the most popular jersey in the world. There are more cell phones in China than there are humans in America. Isn't that crazy? That's really something. And not even half of them have cell, have cell phones either. Most of them are just they text. A lot of their phones don't even call, they just text. Oh, that's really nice. Oh, that's People cool. propose over text message. That was the thing with Yellow. Okay, that's the case. Oh, uh, Jake Hill. Yeah. That's actually going to be out. He didn't really do that, though. Yeah. That was the thing with Yellow being how like, the NBA would never win him out of the All Star game and stuff like that because he made so much money. Right. Right. He did, yeah, he was a global. David Stern's been a good. Like, to be fair, it's not just Asia. We have tons of Europeans in the league now, and they're really good. And that's also breaking some of the stereotypes about white athletes, because Mono Ginobili is, without exception, well, he's like 90 now, but he was one of the most athletic guys in the league for a while. Steve Dash, I mean, he's... Steve Dash was good. He was, um, he, he was two-time MVP in a row, and he was athletic. He was never a burner. He was never like Rajon Rondo fast. No, but he was, but he was a point guard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was the best point guard in the league for a couple of years. Yeah. But, yeah, and although not American, Canadian. Um, people in Canada. He also, he also was thinking he probably could have gone pro in soccer, too. So, so why is Kobe Bryant so big in China? I've never understood that. Um, Kobe Bryant's mom, is not she part Asian? Huh? He has something. He's popular around the world also because his dad played in Europe. Um, he speaks a couple languages. Kobe Bryant in high school was really smart. I mean, really big test scores. He just um, happened to be off in basketball. He actually took Brandy to his prom. She was like 19 or 20, and of course he was 17. Brandy, she was like the coolest hip hop um, or R&B female singer at the time, and she was like almost 20. And Kobe Bryant, if you could, Kobe Bryant now is like the worker. I gotta win all the time guy. When he was first coming out of high school, he w thought he was the coolest human who's ever walked. And to his prom, he brought Brandy and wore sunglasses and stuff. And he got to the league. You know, LeBron James got to the league and started starting immediately and was awesome. Kobe Bryant got to the league and sat right on the bench the first year. And only averaged like six points a game or something like that for the first couple of years. Because the NBA was better back then. Right. Um, people just aren't as good as they used to. And not as humans aren't as good, but because of Kyle's and stuff, the NBA just isn't as talented. I mean, if Willie Colley Stein's going to be a first round draft point, really? Really, Kyle Stein five, ten years ago, they would have laughed at that he would even consider to one day be in the NBA, and now he's a first round draft pick probably this year. So, why is he in the NBA? Because he's a basketball Well, we'll talk about it this time. All right, let's talk about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. All right, we call this SNCC. What about the SC Southern Christian?